I am trying very hard to answer as many of the DMs that come through the show as possible, particularly from Tanzania. So many people in Tanzania are unhappy and they want this platform to showcase their displeasure of what happened over the past weekend on Friday night playing Sundowns. I said this to you. I said it's one of those that's going to go on for a very long time on whichever side of the ball you are on. Whether you're fully across the line or the ball is kissing the line, whichever side you are on, this is a conversation that is going to go on for a very long time. And they said, Andile, we watch the show on YouTube. We watch the show on the SABC platform, on uh, Instagram, as well as on Twitter, on Facebook. And we want our say too. And I said, hey guys, we'll make a, we'll make a plan. We'll make a plan. So for everybody that's, watch, that's listening at the moment in Tanzania, uh, once you're speaking about Yanga, we will make a plan. That plan is not going to be today though because I have a date with Arsenal today. I have a date with Arsenal today who are playing Bayern Munich. If you remember what happened the last time they played Bayern Munich, uh, five goals away, five goals at home. But this is a different Arsenal than that Arsenal. But also... In the same word, this is a different Bayern Munich altogether. It's going to be a brilliant game. It's going to be an absolutely brilliant game. And I look forward to it. But I look forward to discussing it with some of the analysts that we're going to be having today. Because we've got the best in the world coming on to talk about the matters of Champions League this evening. And we're going to be speaking to them about all things Champions League. Not just that big one game. Because the other match this evening as well, and I'm rushing straight home to go and watch it. The other match today again is, is another one for the books, isn't it? It is Real Madrid playing Manchester City. What? <laughs> what? Eh? What? That is the lineup. So we're going to be talking about that as well. And Sundowns play Cape Town City, uh, Cape Town Spurs, rather, sorry. And we'll be keep keeping an update on that match there. It's the best team in the DSTV Premiership with one of the worst teams in the DSTV Premiership in that matchup there. But Sundowns, they didn't uh, have it all their way when they played Richards Bay, which sits in the same company as what Cape Town uh, uh, Spurs does as well. But also, also a matter of national pride. Banyana Banyana at 7.30 at Loftus. Kick off against Nigeria. What's on the line? A spot in France at the Olympics. Banyana Banyana want to go. They've just come back from the World Cup. They are buoyed by the energy of that winning team. They've already lost in Nigeria by a goal. They're back in South Africa where they could win it all. They could literally win it all this evening. So we'll go to that as well. It's like the 12th of the hour 6. It's a packed show. So let's get it underway. We make sure that we pride ourselves in bringing in the very best analysts and contributors from all over the world. And we're fortunate enough to have the number for Ben Jacobs, sports broadcaster, FWNNUJ member. And unfortunately, a Leicester fan, but he's uh, given us time over the years and uh, continues to do so. And it is something that we pride ourselves in to give you the very best, not just local, but international analyst for the job. Today, we're speaking Champions League and there's no better person than Ben. Ben, welcome and thanks so much for joining us. Good evening. I nearly hung up after you insulted my team <laughs> in the introduction there. Uh, you, you, got, you got a game this evening, don't you? Leicester in action, doing yeah. well, Leeds and also others as well, like Ipswich and Southampton have been wobbling. So we might be back in the Premier League, which means we might be back in the Champions League. And some of your listeners may not remember, but after Leicester won the Premier League and entered into the Champions League for the very first time, mm. they only went and reached the quarter The quarter finals, yes. The quarterfinals, but so I mean, we could be contenders. We nearly got to the semi finals. Unfortunately, Atletico Madrid beat us, but we saw off Sevilla. So, Leicester and Champions League have gone hand in hand recently. So, let's put some respect <laughs> on the Foxes. <laughs> I'll tell you what, Ben, I've been camping on your timeline over the last couple of hours because you've been dishing out Manchester United news, uh, which was music to my uh, Manchester United loving ears here. Some great uh, things happening at Manchester United if you're a fan, some shaking happening there, some new people coming in. Yeah, that's correct. So it's actually an old person going out that's been the big news today. John Murta will depart. I think the opinion was kind of split. Everybody knew for quite some time that he wouldn't be able to continue in his football director title. But the question was, could he take on potentially diminished or different responsibilities? And after a conversation that was very much two-way, a mutual agreement 
has been reached for him to leave the club and it's clear that Dan Ashworth will come in. Manchester United might have to wait for him. And Jason Wilcox will arrive from Southampton as technical director, which is interesting because it means that Darren Fletcher, if he's to stay at the club, and that's Manchester United's hope, will have to take on a different title as well. So what we're seeing under Sir Jim Ratcliffe is a restructuring. Ratcliffe is not necessarily the day-to-day guy, mm. even though he's making the headlines and is often being mentioned by name. So Dave Brailsford has the board oversight at the moment, and Jean-Claude Blanc is also going to be very important from within the INEOS setup. But Manchester United are doing something a bit different to in years gone by since Alex Ferguson left the club. And that's not judging things based upon the manager and making football changes and scapegoating individuals when results don't happen. They're trying to create a new leadership team and build from the top first. And eventually that will filter down to the football department and Eric Ten Hag is going to be judged this summer. But it's about trying to start with the foundations and the executives and the leaders that maybe in years gone by were not accountable at Manchester hmm. United and once that's all built that's when decisions will be taken on players and ultimately this summer on Eric Ten Hag well I can't wait for that but hey that's not the reason you're here Ben I mean we're talking Champions League two English teams at the moment uh, vying for semi-final spots it begins today in the quarterfinals before we even speak about the football it's become such a way that we live in the world now where there's terror attacks and it's something that we need to take very seriously I mean I read a couple of articles and I saw some alerts as well uh, to the endangerment of the particular games that are going to be taking part the four games is there any more to that the games are going ahead with this terror um, uh, uh, you know uh, red alert well not red maybe a little amber alert that's been sent out what do we know about that well it always has to be taken seriously and i think because it's been made clear that there may be the threat of an attack before these games there's going to be enhanced policing the other knock-on effect is in the ticket resale market if you like and it will be very clear at the grounds in terms of the entry point in that everyone's going to have to make sure that they show the correct documentation and that the names correspond to the tickets, which is kind of always the case. But Mm. there'll be extra scrutiny on that to make sure that there's nobody that has a ticket through illegal means that is allowed to slip through the door. And on top of that, there is an extra vigilance around not just the stadiums, but the surrounding vicinities as well. So the games will go ahead as planned. The good news, if you like, not that the threat of terror ever comes with good news, but the positive is that security experts usually state that when there's a higher level of threat, there's less that would be put out in the media for warning, if you like. So before the Champions League final at the Stade de France, we had a very similar tale and thankfully nothing happened. Hopefully everyone will stay safe and it will be the same this evening. Clearly the threat can't be dismissed and everybody does have to be on a higher level of alert. But when it's pre-warned, it can ultimately be to create havoc regarding the need for extra policing regarding the need for extra time to come into the stadium and checking and the other byproduct unfortunately is when this kind of horrible messaging gets put out there sometimes what you get is rogue individuals that think it is an invite for them to cause some kind of havoc and disruption not always or necessarily terror but you can have individuals that think this is an opportunity to, with the police being thinner or all drawn to one place, maybe cause trouble somewhere else. You see that pattern and security experts make that clear as well. So we're not in any way trying to fuel chaos. We're certainly not saying something is going to happen, but there is an acknowledgement from the authorities that this threat of potential terror has been publicly put out there on one particular channel and as a consequence there will be added policing anyone going to the game needs to make sure they've got the correct documentation and take more time to get into the stadium and every individual needs to be alert to the possibility of reporting something untoward even if they think that it's at a low level just perhaps somebody leaves a bag and walks 10 meters away everyone needs to be alert to things like that to make sure that they're pointing things out so there is no trouble and hopefully we're in for a safe night where nothing happens and we're only talking about two fantastic football 
all games. Well, let's begin to do so. I mean, uh, my memory serves me back to 2010 when you speak about that Arsenal game, for instance. The last time they'd come anywhere uh, near the Champions League this far anyway and the last time they took on Bayern but it's a different Arsenal this and it's also a different Bayern isn't it? Yeah Arsenal have got much more chance of beating Bayern 10-2 than the other way around mm. and that's just credit to Mikel Arteta and the mess that Bayern are in and in a weird way it's kind of a free hit for Thomas Tuchel at least because we know he's leaving anyway and this is a chance for him to ultimately do what he did only a few years back in 2021 at Chelsea and win the Champions League again and maybe use that as a motivator from the rest of the Bayern squad's point of view. They know that this is their main focus. And that's the only thing niggling at the back of my mind that maybe Arsenal will worry about. This isn't a Bayern side going toe-to-toe for a Bundesliga title with Leverkusen. Thomas Tuchel has already rightly conceded that Leverkusen are going to win their first ever Bundesliga. So Bayern can throw absolutely everything at this, whereas Arsenal across the two legs have obviously got key Premier League games even more so now because the draw between Manchester United and Liverpool has put Arsenal top on goal difference. So they're not going to be able to rotate. They're not going to be able to rest any players and it's vital therefore that Arsenal take something significant in my opinion more than a one goal lead back to Germany for the second leg so this is a bigger first leg I think for Arsenal than it is for Bayern Munich and in addition to that if you look at how Porto were able to stifle Arsenal and actually get a lead from the first leg in the round of 16. That's not particularly encouraging either. The only advantage is maybe that Bayern play a very different kind of game, much more expansive, much more open, much more end-to-end, much more suited to Arsenal's style. But it is going to be really important that Arsenal, in my opinion anyway, don't just look at this as a halfway point in a tie. They've got to take the 90 minutes as their own entity and try and kill off the game and try and get those floodgates open, score early, get a second goal, take a margin of two goals or more, back to Germany and then you'd expect the game management of Arsenal to see out the tie if it's tight or if it's too open on the other extreme and they allow Bayern to score once or twice then I think they could be in big big trouble but there's no doubt despite the history despite the appeal on paper despite the mouth-watering nature there's absolutely no doubt on paper that Arsenal are big big favourites for this one because Bayern are not only in poor form but they are shipping goals for fun And if Arsenal can't capitalise on that in the first leg, as I say, maybe they're in trouble, but I would expect them to do so. And if Arsenal can score two or three or maybe even more, then in many ways, the second leg, as ridiculous as it sounds in a game of two teams of this kind of quality, but given the form Bayern are in, the second leg might almost, if Arsenal get going, become a bit redundant. I, I hear that and, you know, knowing football and how it rewards good form, which Arsenal is in at the moment, there is one good threat, isn't there? They might be leaking goals, but they've got one man who knows how to score against Arsenal. He's always known how to go score against Arsenal. He's got records that he's got against Arsenal when he played in the Premier League still. Harry Kane is a big factor in this game. He is, but I think Arsenal's tactic is simple. Stop Kane and you stop Bayern. So if they cut out the service <laughs> so and if they police him, it's easier said than done. But Arsenal, I think, have got two centre-backs very geared towards doing that. And the beauty, I think, with Kane, even though, as you rightly say, he's got a tremendous record against Arsenal and will naturally be up for the game even more so, If you're not up for this kind of game, then you shouldn't be in professional football. But Mm. if Kane needs any extra incentivization, it's come back to North London as a former Spurs player and get by in a lead heading back to Germany. But the way Kane plays, I think he can get in this Bayern team and has got in this Bayern team when they've not played well, a little bit isolated. And when, like Arsenal, you've got centre-backs and defenders generally, all that have got a lot of pace an excellent positional awareness. The Arsenal plan will probably be to press Kane and to make sure that he doesn't get the ball in and around the area with his back to goal, nor is he allowed to drop deep and run at them. And you do that by knowing when to play a high line and press him and knowing when to get numbers behind the ball and keep him in non-threatening areas. And then the only ability Bayern will have if they succeed in doing that is getting the ball into the box from less preferable angles or set pieces, at which point Arsenal will be confident, I think, of keeping him quiet 
within the box. It's the kind of night where if Kane has a good game, he's an unstoppable player. And if he scores a worldie, if he does something brilliant, then Mikel Arteta, a bit like when Porto scored their goal in the final minutes of the first leg of the round of 16, may have to put his hands up and say congratulations. But what Arsenal will be looking to do is just make sure that Kane doesn't capitalise off errors. Kane gets limited time on the ball and Kane has to take his opportunities rather than be gifted them. And I think as long as they keep game management and composure and press Tim, then they will feel that they can handle him this evening. And the other difference as well is if you look at Bayern generally compared to Arsenal in wide areas where the service comes from, the two fullbacks, the two central players for Arsenal that may track back out of position into wide areas when they're running to try and stop counterattacks, they've all got pace as well. So I think this is going to be a very difficult evening for Harry Kane where we may actually not see him get too many touches within hmm. the Arsenal box. Wow. I mean, I heard uh, uh, Gabriel Jesus a little bit earlier saying he's the best finisher in the world. When I looked at the stats the last time, I think it was uh, 14 goals that he scored against Arsenal, his third favorite team. Do you know which his first is? He scored 20 against one particular team. 20 against one team. Do you know what? It's probably Leicester. It definitely is Leicester. <laughs> I thought the only reason I know that is because Spurs <laughs> screwed over Leicester on the final day of two seasons when Leicester were pushing for Champions League football and they got two big, big wins against Leicester yeah. and one of them a few years back they scored six goals and I think Kane got four of them so it's Ooh. not hard to tally the 20 of Kane <laughs> against Leicester which is even more annoying because remember he used to play for Leicester I in do. the early part of his career as a low knee. Oh, man. Well, let's move on to the other game. Another English team that's going to be playing. If Manchester City is the best team in the world at the moment, judging by their last two, three, perhaps four seasons, the Pep Guardiola seasons, one might name it, Real Madrid at the moment must be second with the form that they're showing in La Liga. This is one of the biggest clashes in world football at the moment, Ben. Well, this is effectively... Uh... Champions League final for me mm. because I think the winner of this goes on and wins the Champions League now of course there is serious opposition we can hardly say if Man City go through and Arsenal end up in the final it's going to be some kind of procession but there is a clear advantage to whoever wins this tie going through and trying to go on and win the whole thing. And if your Manchester City is defending champions and you knock out Real, then you are, I think, very confident of winning your remaining games and vice versa. Mm. If Real knock out the best team in the world at the moment, then they've got no fears. But this is what I love about the lineup that every single game in this stage of the Champions League has got a box office team. So there may well be over the course of two legs some surprises, but I do think that whoever comes through this tie will feel like they can go on and win the Champions League. And it's going to be very interesting because from Real Madrid's point of view, they're now very familiar with Manchester City. And they know, I think, that they're going to have to take a lead from the first leg. And from Manchester City's perspective, they've got a few key players out. And again, they're going to be aware that compared to the last time when they played Real Madrid, this team is just a little bit different as well, mm -hmm. in particular the Jude Bellingham factor, and that might make all the difference as well. So I think the consensus within the industry when I speak to people or I get predictions from colleagues of mine is that Manchester City are slight favourites for this one over the course of really? two legs. I'm actually not so sure, because in the biggest games, we've seen Bellingham drive Real Madrid, and we're now starting to see, perhaps not today, but not too far off today, the kind of foundations at Real Madrid with the likes of Bellingham and Vinny Jr. and Chouameni and Mbappe to arrive. We're starting to see the revamp. And it's been done slowly and methodically, but the picture is there now. The spine is there. And it might not be this season for Real, but one thing's for sure, when Mbappe, and he will eventually arrive, when Mbappe arrives, heading forwards, this is the spine of a Real team that can dominate in the Champions League for potentially four or five seasons. They're the kind of 11, when they're all fit and on form, that not only still have longevity because they're all young, but can win back-to-back -back Champions Leagues and maybe back-to-back -back Champions Leagues at some point. 
in the next three or five years. So is this going to be the first? And then they get stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And as Ancelotti leaves, whether 2025 or 2026, is he just building the beginning of an era that he's a part of? but someone else comes in and kind of gets the majority of the glory? Or is it one season too soon? And that's probably the debate. And I've just got a sneaky feeling, even though on paper Manchester City are stronger and have got more depth, that Real Madrid are going to come through this tight. Wow, I'm excited. I I look forward to it. Uh, I have an issue, though, and a problem whenever it's Champions League's evenings, such as this one, is that I can't multitask. I'm not sure... You know how I do the jumping from one game to another. My Saturdays are disastrous because I watch so many games. I end up feeling like I didn't see a single one. Ben, which game are you watching? Both. I mean, you have to multitask. I'm going down <laughs> to the Emirates Stadium, so technically my loyalties lie to Arsenal against Bayern. But at my desk, I will have the other game on, and I think it's the only way to watch fixtures of this quality. It's a debate, I suppose, at this stage of the tournament whether or not you do have two games on one night or alternatively whether you stagger the kickoff times and i don't really understand why they're clashing of course you can't predict who's going to draw who or what night things are going to be on but when you get to this point and you have manchester city and arsenal both playing on the same night then, of course, a UK audience in particular are going to be torn. A global audience is probably slightly more drawn towards Real Madrid and then couple that with Pep Guardiola and Man City and maybe that one will have the edge as far as the viewing times are concerned and the figures. But I just don't understand, unless it's down to time zones and not wanting something too early, Mm. I don't understand why they have to clash. We've been blessed with one of the most sensational UCL draws ever for this stage of the season. And those that can't multitask like yourself are unfortunately forced to pick one versus the other. I would encourage people to get two screens and watch both games because I think each of them this evening and in the second legs are going to provide us with football of the highest drama. Ben, I should be letting you go, but I just have one more. You take a look at how Manchester City have been scoring three or more goals in every uh, Champions League game so far this season, right? But you look at the Haaland factor. I mean, you have to go back to uh, what's been said uh, about his form this season and how it's showing him off not to be quite as as as, as of what we thought. You know, the, this lethal striker that needs just half an opportunity to score. How big has he been? Uh, for Man City this season, particularly when you look at Champions League? Or is he that one thing that everybody can look at and say, he's not a Harry Kane. He can't make magic out of nothing. So therefore, that's a weak link that we can point out on. He's improving in that sense, but his game at the moment is not necessarily about how many touches he has or how involved he is. It's about whether he takes his chances. And you know that Manchester City are going to give him three, four, five chances during the game. So it will be about whether or not he's clinical. And because of how long his legs are, how powerful he is in the air and how quick and powerfully he's able to get his shots away, if he's clinical, then he's unstoppable, just as much so as Harry Kane. And I I think that Kane is probably more accurate, but Haaland will be fed more chances, so maybe he doesn't need to be more accurate. What do you want? Two chances for Kane where he takes one of them, or eight chances created for Erling Haaland where he takes two of them. Statistically, Kane has better percentages, but Erling Haaland will end up scoring more goals. And I think Manchester City rely on the fact that they have heavy chance production. And if they feed Haaland, then at times he's unstoppable because he's got power He's got length and reach, which is massive when you're bursting into the box. He he can finish with his feet and his head. He's got good positional sense in and around the box. But of course, if he's kept out of the game, people will say he's overrated and he wasn't involved. And somehow he's not one of the great strikers of his generation. But out of nowhere, he can get a hat trick and then he can get another hat trick. And then before you know it, he's got six goals across two legs in a tie and he's outstanding again in everyone's mind and he's breaking Champions League records left, right and centre. He's quicker to all of the milestones like 10 goals, 20 goals, 30 goals and so on in the Champions League so far than Harry Kane. So I expect him to have an impact but that doesn't mean that he's going to be active 
in every minute of the game. It just means that they're going to feed him chances and it's up to Haaland to be clinical. And we have seen him miss one or two of late. We have seen him in big games be a little bit more of a passenger. But I think in fairness to him, what we've not seen from Manchester City, at least in recent weeks, pretty much actually since December and the Club World Cup, we've not seen consistent back-to-back games of fit starting De Bruyne, fit starting Erling Haaland and potentially Phil Foden and then whoever is picked from the likes of a Grealish or a Doku. So the way Man City function is when De Bruyne is playing in every big game and Erling Haaland is there and they're fit and they're together and then all it needs is Foden who's been absolutely outstanding when De Bruyne and Haaland have been either injured or rested. He's on fire and we definitely should mention him as somebody that can be involved across the whole 90 minutes and can influence this tie. So maybe we're judging Manchester City a little bit unfairly because everyone just expects every single game that Haaland or De Bruyne is involved in. The feeling is that there'll be output. But I kind of think when they're at their most lethal, they both have to be playing. They both have to be fit. And Foden has to shine as well. And luckily now for Manchester City, they are all available and they are all fit. But I'm sure if you look back over the last three or four months since the Club World Cup, actually those players haven't started as many games together or played the entire 90 minutes together as people might presume. And if they fit and they're playing 90 minutes in big games down the stretch, then personally, I think Manchester City are virtually unstoppable. I absolutely love our conversations. Uh, even took a little bit more time than I should. But Ben, what could I do? I've got uh, the amazing Ben Jacobs on the line. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for talking to us. It's an absolute pleasure. Enjoy the games, plural, this evening. Do watch <laughs> both of them. And hey, next time we speak, if it's a week or two in advance anyway, ahead the next legs, my Leicester might even be mathematically promoted. I'll tell you what, if they do get promoted, I'll call you just for that. I look forward to it. Ben Jacobs, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for talking to us. It's exactly 8.39. Take a very quick break, a very quick one, because now we have so much to cover. Look at the time already. A big game uh, in a couple of minutes is going to be starting. It's Banyana Banyana versus Nigeria, uh, one of Africa's biggest rivalries when it comes to football, both in the men and the women, is always South Africa and Nigeria. We saw the biggest form of it, the outpour during the the, the, the CAF uh, uh, Africa Cup of Nations. Well, it's the same in women's football. It's 1-0 at the moment with Nigeria ahead. One game still to play. Let's go to Nigeria now. Like I said, guys, we, we, we bring you the best when it comes to contributors to the show. No different with the digital journalist, ardent woman football writer and writer at Go.com and ORB Media. Samuel Ahmadu now joining us. Samuel, thank you so much for talking to us. How's Nigeria? Yeah, great to, great to be part of the show. Wonderful evening from here in Nigeria. Listen, uh, you know, you and I, we could be good friends off the air, but when it comes to 90 minutes, it's Africa's biggest rivalry, this. It's South Africa versus Nigeria once again. Um, you know, you won with the penalty. We haven't quite seen the penalty yet here, but it looks legit. So I'll give you that. 1-0. It's game two and the most important one. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I have no doubt that uh, this is, like you did re- said, it's the biggest uh, kind of rivalry we could ha- we could speak of about women's football or African men's football uh, in Africa. And I think it's it's a, it's a massive one, seeing how the first deck turned out. And realistically, I think it's a, it's a tough one uh, to, this, to, to, to predict. And I think it surely be one that everyone will be excited about. It's kind of seeing the former champions playing against the reigning champions. And surely it couldn't have come bigger than this. And this is why I think everyone around women's football globally feel that this is a game to watch and it surely uh, will be big uh, for the advertisement of women's football in Africa and also beyond. So I think it's it's a big one. Uh, Surely both sides have so much uh, to chase. South Africa is seeking to return since 2016. Uh, Nigeria, uh, after 15, after 16 years. And so it's really, really a big deal, especially for Elix, who is yet to attend the World, uh, the Olympics uh, for the for the first time as a, a substantive coach of Bayana Bayana team. So I think it's, it's a huge uh, burden on both teams that they just have to fight it all out on the pitch and ensure in the course of 90 minutes, they grind out uh, a, good, a positive result to ensure that we have a very uh, good representation but regardless of what the result turns out, I'm sure from the four finalists, uh, we have good representative capable of giving Africa great, great representation on the global stage. 
we didn't get to see, you know, there, there, there was no link, so we couldn't get to watch the match. We thought that the SABC were going to be broadcasting it, but we weren't able to broadcast that game for whatever reasons, um, you know, th- th- that arose. You watched that first leg, 1-0 at home. I look at that and I think, not a great result for Nigeria. It just opens them up so much coming into South Africa. How would you analyze that first match? Yeah, for me, I think looking back at that game, I think uh, a lot of factors definitely uh, affected how the game went. I think uh, considering the international window, how brief and how short it is, uh, players coming into camp quite a bit late. Nigeria, I think they only had uh, possibly a training or two training sessions together. Uh, South Africa, I know, uh, probably with the local players, but uh, the domestic league players, but realistically with the main uh, strength of the team, which are the which are Basically, the foreign-based players who eventually executed the game, I think it was also difficult that time, that 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 period of time to train together and probably been able to prepare, use whatever opportunities they have, bearing compared considering the injuries and whatever the fatigues and whatever. But I think now this game definitely will tell you a lot more about that first leg game. The first leg game, both sides could express themselves well, and many will complain about the quality of the pitch. But surely you cannot take it away from some of these uh, players. They are f- professionals. They they left Africa to play abroad and they are also uh, players that we've seen over the years. So I think it was a very tightly contested game, even though penalty decided it and which uh, was justifiably given. I think South Africa had an advantage at some moment in the game, uh, a little co- collision between uh, Jermin and the goalkeeper, but of, of, obviously uh, if VAR could have possibly exposed that. But I think on a lighter, on, 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 a, on, a, on a serious note, I think the game uh, didn't probably give what everyone did as expected. But now we have mm-hmm. a bigger one whereby every player, every team are fully rested. They've managed to at least acclimatize a bit. They've probably gotten to familiarize better. All that than they've been meeting for previously. And this time around, it's surely going to be very crucial because uh, I, I, I think the first leg, like, both teams couldn't even express themselves enough. But now we've been seeing uh, probably the better picture of what both sides could really probably do on the pitch. And this is why uh, one is excited. This is happening on a very fantastic grand. Uh, Loftus definitely should surely give us a very, very uh, great showbiz, some, some sort, uh, if, if you ask me. In men's football, it's arguable as to who's better between Nigeria and South Africa, depending on what side of the fence you're sitting on and depending on the era as well. You know, a couple of years ago, even now, perhaps, you know, the, the, the conversation might be, nope, it's always going to be Nigeria. But, you know, depending on who you are. But when it comes to women's football, surely, Samuel, we can agree that Nigeria are going to have a tougher in South Africa playing this Banyana Banyana team because this Banyana Banyana team just seems to have the number of all African teams at the moment. Uh, well, you could say that, but realistically, understanding that the win in Nigeria, no matter how slim, it was a significant win for Nigeria, mm. and no matter how narrow, understanding the fact that Nigeria hadn't won uh, in uh, since 2016 outrightly. Uh, against South Africa and uh, managing to pull off that narrow win, no matter how slim, it's some sort of uh, a, a, a revenge on the cards for Nigeria. And surely, knowing the fact that also played in South Africa, South Af- Nigeria is unbeaten on South African soil, this is a major boost of confidence for the Nigerian girls. And uh, being a nighttime champions doesn't come uh, anywhere easy. And neither mm. are the quality of players we are parading. This is a different uh, set of players that featured at the at the at the as Aisha Buhari does in 2021 and different set of players that also featured at the Women's African Cup of Nations. We have quite a number of new introductions, quite a number of uh, uh, young, talented players who are in the team and who are holding their own at their various club level. And definitely you could look through the transfer and uh, do the uh, international week, uh, the, the last weekend uh, week before the, the international break. You could see how Nigerian players were pouring goals, just same as South African players, but you see the numbers on the Nigerian side and definitely you know that uh, these are teams that's, that's in the process. This is a team that showed a great class at the World Cup and surely they are not resting. They want to come back on the continent and dominate not just dominate as uh, on their past glory but again dominate that yes we are not just uh, champions of the past but we are still in our presence. Thank you so much for talking to us. Uh, depending on what happens, if Nigeria do go all the way to the Olympics, which I'm hoping not, obviously, Samuel here, I uh, have to play my cards out, right? Then we'll speak again. But always a pleasure to have people like yourself who give yourself to this beautiful game, particularly women's football. Thank you for talking to us. Thanks for having me, Andy. It's a great pleasure and wonderful work you guys are doing.
Thank you so much, man. Hey, listen, we are rightfully taking our spot uh, on the continent as the show to listen to, not only just in South Africa, but continentally. And to do so, you need people to contribute that come from everywhere. I mean, this week alone, we've taken you to Tanzania, Nigeria, the UK now. Who knows where the next two days are going to take us? Let's take a quick break. I think we have one more. Because I know they have a good chance of winning. Good evening. Good evening. I'm looking forward to Ikemi Real Madrid and Manchester City. Mm. It won't be an easy game for Madrid, but uh, I strongly believe that they will get a positive result at home. Santiago, Binebao, and they're coming to Ikemi Arsenal, Nepal, Munich. I see Arsenal winning that game uh, because Bayern are not doing very well. In their league and uh, Arsenal are in mm. the form of their life. So, yeah, I 100%. see Arsenal winning that game. Thank you, Ma'a Kucho. Thank uh, Sports Amplified Team. Today it's wins for Bayern Munich and Real Madrid. Hey! Nice boy. Good afternoon, Andy. Good afternoon to the Metro FM listeners. Uh, let, me, let, let me take this opportunity and wish... Hey, banana, banana, all the best. I know they're gonna beat Nigeria today. I'm very confident about it. I trust. I, I have a trust in banana, banana. Hey, thank you. So it's not so from Mpangeni. Good evening, Andile, your team slash crew, and the listeners. This is Kok Mamlo Life for Slorus. Hello, Kok. I would like to wish the three and the girls, banana, banana, all the best. Okay, for today's cool. match at Loftus Hersfeld, I'm praying to God's miracle. You know, Banyana Banyana has making us proud. I'm so wishing them the best. I know they're going to do it. They are going to Paris. God bless them as they are doing that and their families. Thank you so much. Andile, Nicolas in Cape Town. Uh, I so wish a Desiree, uh, you know, Desiree and her team uh, does well tonight. And I remember when I picked her up from uh, the Cape Town International to her home, uh, uh, Hanover Park. We had a lengthy conversation as I was listening to her. She is a passionate person about football. She loves the football and she's not a person that likes to lose. Uh, I can tell you, I can tell you right now, it will only take uh, players, uh, you know, that are, that are so keen to fight hard. Uh, and, uh, and 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 make it happen that uh, you know they win. Banyana, uh, what to call it? Banyana are so good, and they can make it. They can win. Well, I appreciate that. Let's go to your voice uh, calls now. Bongi uh, is it? Bongi Kosi is in Dobsonville. Bongi. Yeah, put on the window. Ah, no, kisha up, wena. The pillar of the put on. Yeah, bongi cheese. Yeah, 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 it is cutting edge. Yeah, Puma Is it Puma Lanjan? You need to know your serious problem at Chief there. So, hey, it's about Vesa who cutting edge. And you put on it. They take it as a Bagusa as a Basapago cutting edge, Bungus. With Andy, I want to see the age and sometimes you know, play more coach, you know, playing a new coach, both things like it. But the gear about Bungus, but the gear has taken no take a chief's number, but Papa I Bungus. Let me go to Peter. I think Peter's the guy I've been looking for. Peter and Brits. Peter. Yes, my man. How, how, are you, how are you doing? I'm very well. I'm very well. Uh, you have a Champions League, is what you want to talk about? Yes, my man. I want to go through to the Champions League. You know, I always support teams from England. Uh, actually, in this, in this one. But I when you look at this, this uh, Man City and Real Madrid, mm. this, this is the final before final, according to my opinion. Or my opinion. You and Ben as well, yeah. Uh, we're going to see the good game here. Uh, tactically, I know that uh, Pep Guardiola is the best now, and then Man City is the, that is the best team uh, currently. 
But you know, but you, but you know, statistically, if you're going to go La Liga versus the Premier League, La Liga has had more wins over the Premier League than any other. Yes, yes, I agree with you on that one. But in this one, I, mean, I go with uh, Man City. I don't see Real Madrid beating Man City. It's gonna be, it can be draw, but I go with Man City. Vinny, Bellingham. No, he's a good. That, that's the that's the best player that I have ever seen uh, recently, but. Compared to what I've seen, Man City, one two one two, one the way they play, the, the, the combination. I mean, even the coach, you can see what these players want, what these coach want, you know. Okay, no, I hear you. Yeah, even go to Arsenal and then Arsenal against uh, Bayern. I I have no doubt that Arsenal is going to to win, but uh, I don't see Arsenal scoring more goals. That is the only problem that uh, I think is going to happen. Because if they can't score three, and then you have to go to 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 Germany and visit Bayern Munich, it's gonna be a problem. So for Arsenal to be on a good position, it's for Arsenal to score more goals. That that's what I want. Well, we'll have this conversation together, guys, tomorrow. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you for coming through. Thank you for calling. I really appreciate it. I see many of you wanting to chat still, but uh, unfortunately, it's run about that time. Um, Got to get out of here for myself and my entire team. We appreciate you. Pella, pella. And so, me.